Hello and welcome to Sweetie Pops video. Thank you to that group of people who very kindly agreed to do the intro for me. I'm in Hoxton today, and if you're like me, of a certain age and into older things of a different era, you may find that all the H's in East London, Hoxton, Haggerston, Hackney, Shoreditch, bit of a stretch, remind you of only one thing, and that's hipsters. Young folk with their craft beer and their trendy cocktails, but I think there's a bit more to it than that. I'm hoping to find some interesting, historic, possibly backstreet boozers, hidden gems here in Hoxton today. When I'm planning these London pub tours, I quite often start with one pub I already know and love that I particularly want to feature and then build the rest of the tour in the local area around that. In this case, that one pub is the Wenlock Arms. Cheers from the Wenlock Arms. In London, this is very much a destination pub. And a couple of people have mentioned this in the comments on previous videos, so I want to seek out. It is a pub I already knew. I think I was last here possibly 15 years ago, quite a while back. It was closed for some period of time around the 1970s and 1980s and then reopened in the 1990s and then established a very strong reputation for Real Ale from then on. Won several awards from Camera, the campaign for Real Ale and still today has an impressive array of 10 hand pumps on the front of the bar. I think one of them was possibly out of order so nine beers to choose from. I'm having a Best Bitter from Five Points Brewery, two Best Bitters in the lineup on the bar there, and uh, a mild and possibly a stout, I forget, and of course a few pale ale type grapefruit flavoured beers, but it certainly wasn't the case where there was just a single thing on offer that I would consider, which is sometimes the case when you get as many as 10 hand pumps. Prior to its current incarnation as very much a free house, this was at one time the Brewery Tap for the Wenlock Brewery, which was located somewhere nearby here and existed in one form or another all the way from the 1830s up to the 1960s. The earliest records I could find of this pub went back to the 1830s, so roughly coinciding with the establishment of the brewery. I found a reference in a newspaper in 1834 to games of single stick being played in the fields next door or at the back of the pub. That's an old sort of English martial art for want of a better word. I think it's roughly similar to kendo. The exterior I think is a largely wood frontage and I believe the colour, the paintwork has changed several times over its lifespan. You can tell by some of the places where it's peeling off that it's had a number of different coats and a number of different colours. There's some quite attractive pilasters separating the windows and they have roughly Corinthian column heads, capitals to them, with miniature bunches of grapes separating the leaves in those capitals. It's a corner pub, originally three entrances, but the entrance right on the corner, the double doors there, have been sealed off for some time apparently. So you enter by one of the side entrances. Probably there would have initially been separate bar areas, there are still mosaic tiles at one of the entrances, denoting a private bar. Inside has been possibly tidied up a little bit since last time I was here, like I say, something like 15 years ago. It looks, uh, but you know, I don't think they've overdone it. It looks sort of neat, but not, certainly not gastro pubified, which is great. Some of the features that I quite liked are the, uh, the columns on the bar counter that support the ceiling. There are these carved wooden figures above the gantry level above the bar counter that remind me almost of figureheads on a ship. They have a sort of mermaid-like character to them. The interior is listed on Camera's pub heritage site. They give it a one-star rating and they note the stillion behind the bar as the real star feature of the pub. There's some nice bar back work in general there with sort of mirrored panelling Another decoration behind the bar, there's a rickety old piano which I'm sure gets used. It's the sort of pub where I imagine they have sing songs now and again. It's a nice interior, I would describe it overall as sort of unfussy, which is great sometimes. It isn't, it isn't a museum, it is a lived in and thriving pub and people generally come here for the excellent beer selection above all else. I would challenge anyone to not find at least something they like in that lineup on the bar, even grumpy old sods like me who can't stand 
pale ale and grapefruit flavoured beers and anything with Cascade and Citra hops in it. Another nice feature of uh, the Wenlock is that they put the prices on the hand pumps. You don't see that in many pubs. I think that's great. This was five pounds, which compared to some recent London freeze feels like a bargain. Next, just off the city road, which forms the southern boundary to the area of Oxton, the Eagle. Cheers from the Eagle. Sorry about the background noise. The, the city road is just over there. Uh, what can you do? So of course the pub's main claim to fame is the nursery rhyme, Pop Goes the Weasel. How many pubs can you think of that are name checked in a nursery rhyme as one of the verses of Pop Goes the Weasel goes up and down the city road, in and out the Eagle. That's the way the money goes, Pop Goes the Weasel. There's a certain amount of debate about the exact meaning of the words in this tune. My favorite derivation for where Pop the Weasel comes from is that Pop is potentially slang for pawn, as in selling something at the pawnbrokers, and weasel may be cockney rhyming slang for coat, weasel and stoked coat. So pop goes the weasel may have at some point in history meant pawning your coat, selling your coat. And as the uh, that verse suggests, you spend so much time in the Eagle pub here that you are required to sell your coat to pay for your bar tab. Prior to the Eagle, there was a pub on this site called the Shepherd and Shepherdess. And you can see that quite clearly marked on the 1799 map of London by Horwood. Hard though it is to believe, in the 18th century, this was actually the edge of London as it was then. And beyond here were fields. The Shepherd and Shepherdess Tavern was practically a country retreat. People would come here from the more densely populated areas of the city of London to enjoy the good quality air and effectively have something akin to an afternoon tea. It was famous for cream cakes. The Shepherd and Shepherdess pub was demolished in the 1820s to make way for an earlier incarnation of the Eagle Tavern. On the grounds of the Eagle Tavern in the 1830s, a small pavilion was constructed, which became the Grecian Theatre, and this was a very famous music hall in its day. So much so, in fact, that it became a bit of a haunt for bawdiness and bad behaviour and the sort of social ills that the Salvation Army thought were at the root of all of society's problems. So in fact, in the 1880s, the Salvation Army bought the property and attempted to turn it into a temperance bar or temperance hotel. This led to widespread protests outside the pub and it was a short-lived tenure of the Salvation Army here at the Eagle. In 1884, music hall superstar of the late Victorian and early Edwardian period, Marie Lloyd made her first public appearance on stage here at the tender age of I believe just 15. The current building of the Eagle Tavern was built around 1900 or 1901. The exterior today has three gables, possibly a hint of Flemish Renaissance here. Perhaps the most prominent feature is of course the corner turret, which has a, an almost weather vane-like feature on top of it with an eagle per the name of the pub. Pub geology fans will be delighted to hear we have more granite at the base of the frontage. This is not a pub that Ruth Siddall has explicitly listed and identified the granite in her excellent publication pub on pub geology. If I had to guess, I would say this is probably Marina Pearl Larvikite. Possibly one of the most attractive entrances, which is now blocked off as far as I can tell, is this arched side door, which has some quite attractive plaster work in the pediment above it. Inside, I don't get the sense there's a lot of original fabric from that 1900 or 1901 rebuild. Possibly the only things that stood out to me as being maybe original were the columns. There's a series of columns projecting from the bar counter and from elsewhere in the pub with Corinthian capitals. There's some nice mosaic floor tiling at one entrance, although that's a little bit obscured right now by the Christmas tree. Also a bit obscured by the Christmas tree is some glazed tiling on one of the walls there, which may well also be early Edwardian, somewhat contemporary with that 1900 rebuild. It's a castle 
brand pub today, which is one of Mitchell and Butler's various pub brands. This is the one that they use for more historic pubs. The beer lineup didn't immediately jump out at me, but I did notice Henry Weston's cider, and I uh, seem to be in the mood for cider today. Next, and can I even get it all in shot? The George and Vulture. Cheers from the George and Vulture. This claims to be London's tallest pub, which is an odd accolade. When have you ever been in a pub and thought to yourself, I do like this pub, but I wish it were a bit taller. It does, however, make it admittedly a useful landmark in the local area. It's a relatively easy pub to find because it does project above some of the surrounding buildings. I include this on today's tour partly because it's the only pub in this area that I could find in Hoxton that is actually mentioned by Pevsner. And I just bought the London North volume that covers this area of London, some other bits nearby, and I wanted to make use of it. So here we go. Pevsner comments that it has a tall striped gable and it's circa 1900. That's it. <laughs> That's what we get for the 40 quid I spent on that volume of Pevsner. Pub geologist Ruth Siddle has visited this pub and identified the granite that is on the exterior at the ground level as emerald and marina pearl lavikite and also gravisforce granite. I think the latter is Swedish. It has gables facing either side so again here I'm led to believe with my very amateur architectural knowledge that it might be some sort of tip of the hat to the Flemish Renaissance which was quite popular in the early 20th century. One of the most attractive features to me are these pepper pot turrets at the corners. I think they're very cute. There isn't a huge amount to write home about in the interior as we see it today but one of the things that's striking as soon as you go through the door is just how high the ceilings are. It also has a uh, what appeared to be a wood fire at one end which was a well, nice touch it? Well, architecturally it looks slightly similar to me to the library that is down the road that now has become the courtyard theater that similarly has these very pronounced gables and striping in amongst the brickwork it's a bit of an unusual pub name and this actually appears in several pubs around the country the origin of it is possibly the pub in the city of london not too far from here of the same name which was originally a George Inn and I believe just after the Great Fire of London that establishment and a nearby establishment were forced to sort of merge together and the other wine merchant nearby brought along his pet vulture. It's a Fuller's house today and they only had a couple of hand pumps but I went for Kutch uh, tiny rebel which sounded relatively safe to me described as a welsh red ale but it turns out it does in fact have citra or cascade hops it's just inescapable isn't it there is a twang of grapefruit to it even in a sort of you know reddish brown beer like that you can't escape the bloody grapefruit but um oh well next the prince arthur cheers from the prince arthur there it is behind me the name here is interesting, Prince Arthur. Two possible derivations of that. Prince Arthur could I either refer to Queen Victoria's third son, who I believe became the governor of Canada, or it could be the older brother of Henry VIII, who died at the tender age of just 15 uh, and then paved the way for Henry VIII to become monarch. The pub's history website has their earliest record cited of this pub, which is the census of 1841. Queen Victoria's third son, Arthur, was born in 1850. So if indeed that census record, which I didn't see directly, if indeed that census record says that the pub dates to 1841 with the current name, then it can't have been named after Queen Victoria's son prior to about 2020 the hanging pub sign was on the first floor rather than where it is now on the second floor you can still see the the, the old bracket where the sign used to be affixed to the wall and the old sign for the pub appeared to depict something like a knight in armor which i assume was a reference to that older prince arthur brother of henry VIII. and the newer sign seems to be a picture of Queen Victoria's third son. A former landlord of this pub was Dixie Dean. 
the boxer who probably had the peak of his career in around the 1960s. He took over this pub in the late 1970s, then ran it for 35 years. And there is a pair of boxing gloves still hanging up on the wall with a photo, which I presume to be of Dixie. Building could possibly be late Georgian, hard to tell. It has these odd buttresses on one side, which make the whole building look slightly lopsided. There is a projected ground floor frontage which supports a balcony on top and the whole curved bay I suppose of that projecting frontage has small paned windows with mottled glass and that gives quite a nice lighting effect on the interior of the pub. It looks to me a tiny bit like a sort of captain's cabin on a ship the pub's quite incongruous with its surroundings. It's sort of an estate pub, essentially, and is apparently much loved by the locals. Inside, there is a sloping bar counter with matchboard panelling, which possibly looks to me 1930s in style. The columns are somewhat interesting. I quite like how they've used the column in the middle of the main bar room to attach a small sort of drink shelf to it. It's a Shepherd Neem pub, today. There was only one hand pump on which was serving Shepherd Neem's Master Brew, which I've never really been a big fan of, so I instead just went for a half of Guinness. So despite the paucity of real ale on offer, I think this has got a certain amount of charm to it as a, a backstreet boozer and a state pub that's obviously popular with its locals and a, a sort of incongruous building that looks sort of wonderfully out of place with its surroundings. Next, and the final stop on today's tour of Hoxton, the Stag's Head. Cheers from the Stag's Head. I've caught this perhaps at a bad moment and a lot of the hand pumps were off, so there was no, uh, no cask beer available. They did have um, good old Guinness, so half of that. This was built in 1936 by Arthur Edward Sewell who was the in-house architect for Truman's and built possibly in, in excess of 50 pubs for the brewery in his time there. There was a fashion at that time in the mid 1930s for eschewing the Victorian style of pubs that went before because they were associated with, with drunkenness and disorder and instead they tended to favour buildings in either neo-Tudor or neo-Georgian style and this is an example of the latter. It has that sort of slightly sloping bar counter that you often see in pubs of that sort of 1930s era and it has a, a spittoon at the base. There are two brick fireplaces from the 1930s and each of those have a stag motif that was common in a lot of Truman's pubs of the era. I slightly ran out of time there, so I'm going to have to do the uh, last little bit of voiceover on the hoof on, on my way back home. But uh, I think that's uh, it's, it's got a lot going for it, the stag's head. The, the current owners just seem sort of full of enthusiasm, very nice people, uh, the staff who are working there right now. And uh, I, I think it says something interesting about that interwar period and their attitude to, uh, to, to, to pubs, to, to drinking, to morality. There was this idea the Victorian pubs were sort of hotbeds of immorality and drunkenness and debauchery and lewd behaviour. And, and that's reflected in the architectural styles of the pubs that came in that interwar period, that they were actively trying to discourage that sort of behaviour and they thought that by harking back to neo-Georgian or neo-Tudor architecture that they would instil in their customers a sense of sort of restraint. It's also a music venue today, they have a stage at the back, a little stage performance area at the back of the pub. One of my favourite features of the pub is a small off-sales area that's sandwiched between two of the bars, had its own distinct entrance at one time. Now it's all opened up and you can easily pass through between them. I don't really think I've done the Stag's Head justice in my coverage of the interior and the exterior, but there is a huge amount, as I said, has been written about this pub, both by camera and Historic England, and I'll put links to both of those articles down in the description there. Well, that's it from Hoxton, bidding you adieu from Old Street Tube Station, just outside it. 
hope that's been interesting and or informative. I think the Wenlock Arms is unsurprisingly still the outstanding pub, the destination pub of Hoxton, but I think there are a few other places there that might be of interest if you happen to be in the area. I think the Stag's Head has that very beautiful 1930s preserved interior and I think there's some very interesting history associated with the Eagle and uh, a couple of other sort of pleasant backstreet boozers into the mix as well. So thanks very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.